Welcome everybody online. We're going to get down today. So, and I'm going to, I'm going to start right away by reading in Luke chapter eight and uh, starting in verse 41. I'm going to read all the way through verse 55. So hope you came ready for some scripture because I'm throwing it at you today. So starting in verse 41, a man named Jairus, a leader of the local synagogue, came and fell at Jesus' feet, pleading with him to come home with him. His only daughter, who was about 12 years old, was dying. As Jesus went with him, he was surrounded by the crowds. And a woman in the crowd who had suffered for 12 years with constant bleeding, she could find no cure. Coming up behind Jesus, she touched the fringe of his robe. Maybe you've heard it as the hem of his garment. And immediately, somebody say immediately, immediately, immediately the bleeding stopped. Who touched me? Jesus asked, and everyone denied it. Peter said, Master, this whole crowd is pressing up against you. But Jesus said, Someone deliberately touched me, for I felt healing power go out from me. When the woman realized that she could not stay hidden, she began to tremble and fell to her knees in front of him. The whole crowd heard her explain why she had touched him and that she had been immediately healed. Daughter, he said to her, your faith has made you well. Go in peace. Verse 49, while he was still speaking to her, a messenger arrived from the home of Jairus, the leader of the synagogue, and he told him, your daughter is dead. There's no use troubling the teacher now. But when Jesus heard what had happened, he said to Jairus, don't be afraid. Just have faith and she will be healed. Verse 51, when they arrived at the house, Jesus wouldn't let anyone go in with him except Peter, John, James, and the little girl's father and mother. The house was filled with people weeping and wailing, but he said, stop the weeping. She isn't dead. She's only asleep. But the crowd laughed at him because they all knew she had died. Then Jesus took her by the hand and said in a loud voice, my child, get up. And at that moment, her life returned and she immediately stood up. Somebody say immediately. immediately. Look at somebody and tell them immediately. 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 We're going to dig into this today because it's two stories, but it's one message. Two stories, one message. And we're going to dig into this because you have Jairus, whose 12-year-old daughter is dying. And you have this woman who's had this blood disease for 12 years. And both have no hope. Both have no healing without Jesus. Jairus, it's interesting because it says he was a synagogue leader. He was a synagogue leader in Galilee. He was esteemed. He was influential. He was affluential as he was wealthy. And, you know, I've learned that people that have influence and affluence, they get certain privileges that the rest of the world doesn't get. They have access to certain things the rest of the world does not have access to. They can get to certain people that the rest of the world can't get to. They can buy their way into certain situations. They can buy themselves out of certain situations, those with money, but not this time. No money, no influence, no affluence would fix Jairus' daughter. Another thing I've learned is that and those of you that have kids, you can tell me if I'm right, is that your kids are your kryptonite. And what I mean by that is you can have all the confidence, you can have all the swagger, you can have all the influence, you can have all the affluence in the world until the devil attacks your kids and then it drops you. When the devil attacks your kids, nothing makes you feel more scared, more weak, more vulnerable more desperate than when your kids are under a spiritual assault. So Jairus is desperate. He needs Jesus. And he needs Jesus now. Time is of the essence. But the crowds are slowing him down. And then there's this woman with the blood disease. 
And she's also desperate. She needs Jesus as well. But unlike Jairus, she's considered a nobody. She's destitute, forgotten. She is unclean because of her blood disease. She's unnamed. The Bible doesn't even say her name. She's ostracized from society by Jewish law because of her blood disease. She would have been ceremonially unclean, not permitted to touch anybody, not even her own family, or they too would be unclean and defiled. So I want to I want to look at verse 3, uh, verse 43. Look at it again with me. Verse 43. It says, A woman in the crowd had suffered for 12 years with constant bleeding, and she could find no cure. Would you read that with me out loud? Ready? Here we go. A woman in the crowd suffered for 12 years with constant bleeding, and she could find no cure. Let's pray. Father, thank you for your word today. God, we pray you would speak to us. God, we came in this place because we need a touch. We need a touch. So God, we reach out to you and we ask for your healing touch. We ask for your supernatural touch, for your miraculous power to be upon our lives today. God, bless this word. Change us. In Jesus' name, we all say amen. 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 I want you to look at this verse again with me one more time. Verse 43, it says, A woman in the crowd had suffered for 12 years with constant bleeding, and she could find no cure. Now, when I break this verse down, I, I see three things. Three things really stand out at me. The first thing that stands out is that she was suffering. This woman is suffering. Suffering is a deeper level of pain. Suffering, you might be suffering today. Right, your relationship might be suffering or your marriage might be suffering. Maybe your soul is suffering. Your emotional state is suffering. Your health is suffering. Maybe your heart has been broken and your heart is suffering. It says she was suffering. The second thing I notice about this verse is that it was constant. It was constant. It says she had suffered for 12 years with constant bleeding. It was constant. And some of you feel that way right now, that your suffering is constant. Man, it won't go away. It's not letting up. It's not letting go. I can't get any relief from my suffering. And the third thing I notice is it says that she could find no cure. And if I'm transparent, I feel that in my own life. When you've tried everything you know to try, but you come up short. When you're standing at what seems like the edge of hopelessness. Listen, I've got some things in my life that without God, there's no cure. Without God, there's no solution. There's no healing. There's no deliverance. Without Jesus, I will remain in a constant struggle, a constant suffering. I cannot fix it on my own. I don't have the answers. I don't have the wisdom. I don't have the words. I don't have the power. Only Jesus can do it. And the same is true with you. Without God, there's no hope. Without Jesus, you will remain in a constant struggle, a constant suffering. But Impact Church, do you know what the good news is? The good news is, is that you're not without God. You're not without Jesus. God is with you. God is for you. And he can fix it. And he does have the answers. And he does have the wisdom. And he does have the power. And I believe that God is going to do it for you, just like he did it for the woman with the blood disease, and just like he did it for this 12-year-old girl. In verse 44, I, I want you to look at it with me again. Would you look at it with me again? Verse 44, it says, coming up behind Jesus, she touched the friend of his robe, and immediately, immediately, somebody say immediately, immediately, look at somebody and tell them immediately, immediately, the bleeding stopped. I believe that God's going to do it immediately, just like he did for this 12-year-old girl when it says in verse 54, then Jesus took her by the hand 
and he said in a loud voice, my child, get up. And at that moment, her life returned to her and she immediately stood up. Somebody say, immediately, immediately. The bleeding stopped immediately. Immediately, the child stood up. What I'm saying is, God, I need you immediately. God, my marriage needs you immediately. God, my daughter needs you immediately. God, my son needs you immediately. God, my health, it needs you immediately. God, my mind, my mind, I'm losing my mind, God. I need you immediately. I need you immediately. God, not tomorrow, not next week, not next year, not next year. I need you immediately. Come on, somebody say immediately, immediately, immediately. Say it again, immediately, immediately. Turn around and tell somebody you haven't told yet because they're ugly. Immediately, immediately, immediately. If, 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 if you're suffering today, this message is for you. If you need a touch from Jesus Christ today, this word is for you. Throw away the crutches and go all in for Jesus. Today I've titled my message, Throw Away the Crutches. Look at another person you have not looked at yet and tell them you need to throw away the crutches. Throw away the crutches. Y'all don't even know what I'm talking about yet. But you're preaching. You're preaching before you're preaching. Crutches are those things in your life that, you know, you, you have some things in your life that are broken. Y'all know that, right? You, you have some things in your life that are broken. And instead of running to Jesus, you grabbed a pair of crutches. And you got used to those pair of crutches. And now you depend on on those crutches to get you through. See, crutches are those things that you've convinced yourself are supporting your life, but they're actually sabotaging your life. And we grab all sorts of crutches as humans, the crutch of drug, the crutch of drug addiction, the crutches of alcoholism, the crutches of money or the love of money, the crutches of a bad relationship. Uh, the crutches of codependency, the crutches of lust, the crutches of greed. Somebody say it's time to throw away the crutches. Come on, say it out loud. See, we, we, grab, these, we grab these crutches in effort to relieve the pain, but all we're doing is weakening the injury. We grab these crutches thinking in our minds this will relieve the pain, and all we're doing is weakening the injury. It's like self-medicating, trying to numb the pain, trying to hide the pain, trying to cover up the pain like a Band-Aid. You know what I've learned about Band-Aids is that things that are covered up don't heal well. So take off the Band-Aids, throw away the crutches. What I'm really trying to say is uncover your pain. And get into the presence of Jesus Christ. And let God heal you. And let God heal you. I want you to write three things down today. Three things that really is the crux of this message. And three things that I believe if you apply these to your life. That God will change you. And the number one thing is that you find power in his presence. You find power in his presence. Everybody's looking for power. We're looking for power to... to, to, to to heal ourselves. We're looking for the power to have mental health. We're looking to the power just to get through another day. Everybody wants power. Some people want power, power. I just want to be in charge. I want to be large and in charge. And they want power. And, you know, everybody looking for the real, the real power. The real power. The real power 
is in the presence of Jesus Christ. The real power is in the presence of Jesus Christ. There's power in his presence. I I want you to go throw away the crutches and go all in for Jesus Christ. It says in verse 44, coming up behind Jesus, she touched the fringe of his robe and immediately the bleeding stopped. Listen, the real power you're looking for is in the presence of God. Everything else is artificial. The real power that you're looking for, it's not in a building, it's not at Impact Church, it's not a preacher, it's not a worship leader. The real power that you're looking for is in the presence of God Almighty, the presence of Jesus Christ. In Psalm 16, it says, it says, in his presence, there's fullness of joy. Don't you want a fullness of joy? In his presence is fullness of joy. In his presence, we find peace. In his presence, we find courage and confidence. It's in his presence that I find forgiveness. It's in his presence that I find freedom. It's in his presence that I find healing. It's in his presence where I find power. Go all in for Jesus and you will find his presence. She comes up behind Jesus. I want to read this again. It touches the hem of his garment in verse 45. Who touched me? Jesus asked. Everyone denied. When Peter said, Master, the whole crowd is pressing up against you. But Jesus said, someone deliberately touched me. Someone deliberately touched me, for I felt healing power go out from me. When the woman realized that she could not stay hidden, she began to tremble and fell to her knees in front of him. The whole crowd heard her explain why she touched him and that she had been immediately healed. Daughter, your faith has made you well. Go in peace. When she realized she could not stay hidden. When she realized she could. Why was she trying to stay hidden? Because she was considered unclean. Because by law, she would not have been allowed to be in public, let alone in a crowd, let alone approaching a rabbi, let alone touching a rabbi. But all you know, just like I know, Everybody knows you cannot hide from the presence of God. And God calls us out from our hiding places. He calls us out of the shadows into his marvelous light. So when she realized she could not stay hidden, she began to tremble. She begins to tremble. And she falls to her knees in front of him and the whole crowd heard her explain listen do you you even know why God does miracles do you even know why there's two reasons why God does miracles one is because he loves you He cares for you. But the other reason is he wants to give you a testimony. Because your testimony is going to set others free. He loves you. And he's giving you a story about God's glory. The whole crowd heard her explain. The whole crowd heard her explain. God doesn't want you to stay in silence. He doesn't want you to hide in the crowd. Some of you today, you're hiding in the crowd. Some of you today, listen, if you hide in the crowd for too long, you're going to get lost in the crowd. The crowd will suffocate your spiritual life. The crowd will squeeze God right out of your life. So 
So don't let the crowd hold you back. Go all in for Jesus. I want to give you point number two. Is that you find purpose in his presence. Purpose. Verse 54 and 55, then Jesus took her by the hand and said in a loud voice, my child, get up. And at that moment, her life returned to her and she immediately, somebody say immediately, she immediately stood up. My child, get up. And at that moment, her life Return to her. Listen, for somebody in here, you feel like you have lost yourself. You've lost your identity. You don't even know who you are. You've lost your purpose. You've lost that spark that once made you, you. You've lost your joy. You might feel dead inside. You might feel depressed. You might feel numb to the world. You might feel hopeless. You know, trauma can do that to you. Sickness can do that to people. Divorce can do that to people. Failure can do that to people. Betrayal can do that to people. See, the enemy tries to suck the life right out of you. The enemy tries to steal every good thing that God created for you away from you. That's why John 10, 10 says that the thief comes only. Did you see that word? Only. The thief comes only to steal, to kill, to destroy. But that's also why the second part of the verse says, Jesus said, I came that you might have life. And not only life, but you would have it abundantly. That you would have, you wouldn't just be surviving you're going to be thriving, that you have life and life abundantly. Listen, if you feel dead today, if you feel like your marriage has died, if you feel like your relationship has died, if you feel like your hope has died, if you feel like your heart has died, if you feel purposeless in life today, if you feel numb to the world today, if you feel hurting inside, if you feel like you've lost something in life today, if any of these are you, I came to prophesy over your life today that your life is about to return to you. Your life is about to return. 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 Life is about to return. My child, get up because your life is about to return. My child, get up because joy is about to return. My child, get up because peace is about to return. My child, get up because purpose is about to return. My child, get up because your health is about to return. My child, get up because you shall love again. Because you shall be loved again. My child, get up. Get up! What I'm trying to tell you, what I'm trying to tell you is that hell is not ready for the new you that is about to be resurrected from the dead. You know, I don't know if you've ever had something in your life that, or experienced something in your life that you know it works, and then you try to tell it to somebody else. And they don't do it. And they keep living in this cycle of idiocy. 
I'm trying to tell you, there's a secret to life, and that's the presence of Jesus Christ. It's his presence. It's his presence. There's this guy in the Bible, his name is Job, and he, he has the worst life imaginable. Like, if you think your life is bad, read the book of Job. And, and, and it's, it's terrible. The whole book is terrible. He loses his wife. He loses his kids. He loses his wealth. He loses his reputation. He loses everything. It's like a country song. Like, it's bad. <laughs> <laughs> and so it, it's, but at the end of the book, it gets good again. Because at the end of the book, God gives him a double blessing, a double portion of everything that he originally had. Why would God do that? Why would God give somebody a double portion, a double blessing? Because he was really good looking, of course. That's, <laughs> it's not because he was good looking. It's not because, oh, he lived in Scottsdale. <laughs> he lived in Paradise Valley, you know. I mean, people are blessed, like, He was given a double portion because when everything was stripped away from him, he stayed faithful. He stayed faithful. And what I'm telling you today is if this message is speaking to you in any way, shape or form, I want you to do like Job did and get into the presence of God Almighty and praise God anyway. Praise God anyway. Praise is a spiritual weapon that most people don't even know how to use. You know, I got guns at my house. Don't pull up on me. I still got guns from the year 2000 because the whole world is going to... I got guns and tuna left from the year 2000. Yeah, because... The computers were going to roll over and we were all going to die. And then, of course, electricity wouldn't work. And then if electricity didn't work, well, we couldn't get groceries and food. And, uh, you know, so I still have tuna and ammo from 1999. And I'm going to be straight up real with you. If you broke into my house, I have not shot some of these guns. But I have them. I, I... I'll probably die because I wouldn't know how to use it. I have them. <laughs> I have guns. <laughs> I just don't know how to, I don't know how to use a couple of them. <laughs> I, I would die. Some of you, some of you are going to die because you have the spiritual weapon of praise but you don't use it. You don't even know how to use it. You don't tap into that spiritual weapon for your life. Praise is a spiritual weapon. You read through the Bible, praise is what brought the walls of Jericho down. Praise is what uh, made Judah be able to defeat its surrounding enemy nations. Praise is what broke the prison doors for Paul and Silas. I'm saying praise him anyway. Worship him Anyway, Job has everything stripped from him. His wife, his children, his wealth, his reputation. And he said, naked I came from my mother's womb and naked shall I return there. The Lord gave and the Lord has taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. He says in Job 13, though he slay me, yet will I trust him. Though he slay me. Man, I'm talking about praising him. I'm talking about praising him, man. I'm talking about, I'm not, I'm not, let me tell you what I'm not talking about. I'm not talking about coming to church and playing freaking patty cake with Jesus during the worship. Oh, she's cute. Oh, oh, he's fine. He, eh. 
<laughs> what, what I'm saying is this, is that I, I'm talking about coming, coming ready and expecting in a posture of praise and worship. I'm talking about reaching out and deliberately, deliberately touching him. Jesus said, someone deliberately touched me for I felt healing power go out from me deliberately, intentionally. She was on a mission to get into the presence of Jesus. She was on a mission to get her breakthrough. See, some of y'all, you'll never get your breakthrough because you're not deliberate. See, some people aren't deliberate. They're indifferent. They're indifferent. They're, they're halfway in for Jesus, and then they're halfway in for the world. They, they like the fact that Jesus died for them. They just don't want to live for him. Get into God's presence. Some of y'all have been tiptoeing around God's presence, and you never got into God's presence. Stop showing up to church every now and freaking then. <laughs> Some of you treat church like you treat your gym membership. You know what I'm saying? Like, yeah, I'm a member of Glory Gains. I go every January, twice a year. <laughs> you know, it's like you wonder... While life is not working out the way you want it to work out, be deliberate. Be deliberate. I'm going to reach out in every way I know how. See, see, you show up to church. When you do show up to church, the presence of God, listen, the presence of God is, is in this place. You know, what I, you know what I hear people say all the time? I hear these kind of things. People say these kind of things all the time. It's like, well, the Holy Spirit is... Alive at Impact Church. The Holy Spirit is alive anyway. <laughs> I, I, I take that as a compliment. That's cool because, like, we, we welcome the presence and the power of God. I'm not here to do a presentation, you know. I'm not here to perform. Uh, our worship team's not here to, to be watched. They're here to worship God. And, and, but, but people say, you know, boy, man, I don't know what it is, but I got goosebumps. Every time I walk into that, I get goosebumps. Some people, man, the music's playing, and, and I just start crying. I don't even know why I'm crying. I don't even know why I'm crying. You get goosebumps, and you cry, and you tremble because that's the power of the presence of God Almighty. That's the power of the presence of God Almighty. And you start feeling that, and then some of you shut out. Let go. Let go, man. Do you want life change or not? Let go. Let go. Let go. Let God do what God wants to do. Listen, it, you get into his presence. Some people get into his presence. You're surrounded by his presence, but you won't reach out. You won't drop to your knees and plead with God. Listen, there is a posture when you get into the presence of God. There is a posture of the heart. There's a physical posture. There was a posture with Jairus. There was a posture with the woman with the blood disease. Look at what it says in verse 41. A man named Jairus, the leader of the local synagogue, came and fell at Jesus' feet. The woman realized she could no longer stay hidden. She trembled and fell to her knees in front of him. See, when I get on my knees... I'm demonstrating humility. I'm demonstrating that I am not God and he is. I'm demonstrating desperation. I'm demonstrating that God is sovereign. Why is everybody afraid? I don't understand. The world ain't afraid of nothing. The world is 
bolder than I ever remember it in my whole life for worldly things. The church of God is quieter than I ever remember it in my life about godly things. You know what? The world needs the presence of God. They need the presence of God. Because that's where the power of God. That's where purpose comes from. So when I get into this posture, it's a posture that, God, I love you. I adore you. You are my creator. You are my maker. And whether you can physically get on your knees or not, it's still the posture of your heart. It's still the posture of your mind. And when somebody moves from indifferently to deliberately, that's when the fire of God is lit inside of your soul. And I'm not just talking about getting into God's presence. I'm talking about you getting God's presence inside of you. There's a big difference, man. You remember this dude named Peter in the Bible? Say yes. Say yes. Peter. Peter was one of Jesus' closest disciples. And Peter moved from deliberate. He, he moved too deliberate. He moved from indifferent to deliberate. Peter moved, Peter moved from coward to courageous. If you remember the story, Judas denies, uh, Judas, Judas betrays Jesus with a kiss, by the way. Be careful, those that look like they like you and they love you and they're on your side, boy. I like you. I'm about to betray you for some money. I'm about to sell you out to the devil. I'm about to roll you. People get close to you at work. You're like, what's this deal? If you're a boss, if you're a super, you got to really pay attention, man. You got these people sucking up to you and stuff like, hey, they got an angle. And he betrays Jesus with a kiss. He gets arrested and taken. And then people see Peter and they're like, yo, you with him, right? <laughs> no, I don't know the guy. No, no, I'm pretty sure you would. Do not know that man. The Bible says he's denied three times, which Jesus prophesied and told him. He said to Peter, this is going to happen. Denies three times. He's afraid. He's scared. But then 50, day, 50 days, listen to this, 50 days after, after the resurrection. Do you know what day that was? Does anybody at all know? 50 days after the resurrection. It's the day of Pentecost. That's why it's called Pentecost. Now you know. You're like, oh. <laughs> Fifty days after the resurrection, something changed in Peter. Something changed in Peter because Peter went from being around the presence of God to having the presence of God inside of him. See, something changed. And 40 days after the resurrection, 40 days after Jesus rose, he appears to his disciples over a period of 40 days. And he goes to his disciples in Acts chapter 1, and he gives them some information, and then he ascends to heaven. Here's the information he gave them. Acts chapter 1, verse 4 and 5. Don't, don't leave Jerusalem, guys. Don't leave here, but wait for the gift my father promised, which you have heard me speak about. Listen, pay attention. This is critical information. He said, for John baptized you with water, but in a few days you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. You will receive, listen, this is critical, you will receive power when the Holy Spirit comes on you and you will be my witness in Jerusalem, Judea, Samaria, and to the ends of the, ends of the earth. This is 40 days after the resurrection and then 10 days later is Acts chapter 2. I don't even know if y'all are ready for this, but this is, this is, this is ready. This is ready worthy. Acts 2. When the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place. Suddenly, 
a sound like the blowing of a violent wind came from heaven and filled the whole house where they were sitting and they saw what seemed to be tongues of fire that separated and came to rest on each of them. All of them were filled. All of them were what? Filled. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit enabled him. Let's look backwards. Acts 1.5. In a few days, you will be baptized with the Holy Spirit. Acts 1.8. You will receive power to be my witnesses. Let's fast forward. Acts 2.4. All of them were filled with the Holy Spirit. Peter goes from coward to courageous. Peter goes from denying Christ to declaring Christ. He goes from being around the presence of Jesus to being filled with the presence of Jesus. Baptized by the Holy Spirit. Baptized by fire. They start speaking in tongues. <laughs> this is one of the most fascinating pieces to this entire scripture to me is what I'm about to tell you. This is the most fascinating piece to me because this whole thing with the speaking in tongues, this whole event I'm about to teach you happened during Pentecost. In other words, Jesus is supernatural, but he's also strategic because Pentecost was the, the, the time when Jerusalem was overpopulated with people because Jews came from all the surrounding nations to celebrate Pentecost. And these Jews have their own languages. And the Bible lists like 15 of them, this, that, the other, all these people from different nations. And they don't speak the same language that Peter and John and James and all the disciples speak. And they're walking by. This is a moment when Jesus can maximize his impact. They're walking by where the disciples were and they hear this sound and the Bible says they're bewildered and utterly amazed because the disciples are not speaking in their own language. They're actually speaking in their languages. They're speaking in their foreign tongues. They're supernaturally speaking in native tongues of the people while they're walking by, and it says in verse 11, what were they speaking about? It says they were declaring the wonders of God in our own tongues. <laughs> and, and, and Peter, remember Peter, because it's 9 a.m., and some people were tripping like, I don't know, they must be drunk. That's what the Bible says. That's weird, they must be drunk. Like, have you ever got so lit you started speaking another language, you know what I'm saying? Like... <laughs> I don't know. I just learned Spanish. That's crazy. Like, I don't know what idiot said that. Like, you know, I don't know. I got so drunk. I know Chinese now. Like, what happened to me? Like, <laughs> it, just, it must be drunk. It must be drunk. And Peter, remember Peter? Coward Peter. I don't know him. I'm not with him. Coward Peter turns into courageous Peter. And Peter, filled with the Holy Ghost, baptized with fire, Peter stands up in the boldness in the gospel of Jesus Christ gets preached and he said we're not drunk as you suppose first of all it's only 9 a.m. in the morning second of all this is that what has been prophesied in the Old Testament that in the last days I will pour out my spirit on all flesh and he goes and he preaches this Pentecostal sermon probably the first Pentecostal sermon ever recorded and he preaches this sermon and the Bible says 3,000 people give their life to Jesus Christ right after that sermon. What, what I'm saying is that maximum exposure, if you're obedient, equates to maximum impact. Chase the presence of God. Chase the presence of God and watch God change it. Number three, write this down. You find peace in his presence. Peace. Peace. The world needs peace. Jesus told the woman with the blood disease, he said, daughter, he said, daughter, he said, daughter, he said, your faith has made you well. Go in peace. 
after suffering for 12 years constantly without a cure, she touches the hem of his garment and immediately her body is at peace. Immediately she receives healing. Immediately she receives wholeness. You know, if there's one lesson that I lived in 2022... I should say not if. I'm going to say there's one lesson that I learned in 2022. And it's that spiritual warfare is no freaking joke. And I know a lot of you think, well, you know, PT had a brain aneurysm and a stroke on November 14th. I did. That wasn't even the worst of what happened in my year. No joke, man. Spiritual warfare is is no joke. Spiritual warfare is real. And anytime you're in warfare, the first thing the devil targets is he tries to blow out your faith. It's his first thing he does. Targets your faith. Because he wants you faithless. He wants you hopeless. Y'all understand that? There's an enemy that's real. His only purpose is to steal, to kill, to destroy you, your life, your health, your marriage, your child, your purpose. His only. So he targets our faith. He wants us faithless. He wants us hopeless. This is, this is why. Ephesians 6.16 says what it says. He says, take up the shield of faith with which you can extinguish all the flaming arrows of the evil one. It's critical to keep your faith. Take up your shield of faith. He, he, He said, daughter, your faith has made you well. Daughter, your faith, your faith has made you well. He said to Jairus, don't be afraid, just have faith. And she will be healed. See, your faith, it's your shield. It's your shield, man. I I got faith, though. I'm under attack, but I got faith. I'm under attack from every direction, but I got faith. I got faith in Jesus Christ. My faith is in him. My faith is in his power. My faith is in his goodness. I got this shield. And this faith, if that faith shield is taken, it's over. So faith is your shield. But hope, hmm. hope, hope, hope is my hiding place. And I hide in hope a lot. God, I'm going to hide behind this hope. That you're going to do this. God, I'm going to hide behind this hope, the scripture that you gave me. I'm going to hide behind it. I'm going to stand behind it. Hope is your hiding place. And the devil's targeting. And he doesn't let up, unfortunately. Twelve years. Constant. Twelve years. And one thing I've learned about spiritual warfare is that is that the battle is always the hardest right before you break through. If it seems like all hell has been gunning for you, it's because the devil knows that your breakthrough is right around the corner, so he's throwing every last thing he's got at you. If you feel like you're being hit from every direction, your victory is right around the corner. The wall of defeat is always biggest when you're the closest to it. I was thinking... about how Jairus must have felt.
when this woman interrupted him and got her healing. I was wondering what that must have felt like. This woman with the blood disease gets healed. Jairus, there's no point. Your daughter died. How did he feel in that moment? Like, how do you feel when it seems like God answers everybody else's prayer, but he's not answering my prayer? How do you feel when it feels like God gives someone else their breakthrough, but you haven't got your breakthrough? How do you feel when everybody else around you is getting married and you can't get a date? How do you feel when everyone around you is getting pregnant and you can't get pregnant? How do you feel when people don't even want babies? They're just going to abort the babies. They don't even want them. They're going to go out, spread their legs, and get pregnant. They don't want the baby. We want to freak like we're married, but I don't want this child. Got quiet in here. How do you feel when this person... They're aborting their baby. They don't want this child. I want a child so desperately. I want to raise a man of God. I want to raise a woman of God. Let's be real. That's tough, man. It does not get any tougher than that. It's hard not to be jealous, not to be envious, not to covet, not to be angry, to be honest. But I want to tell you, just because you haven't gotten it yet, just like Jairus, it's coming. It's coming. Don't you give up. Don't you give up. Don't you give up. It's coming. It's coming. thought about this message a lot well because I've had a long time to write it (laughs) and uh, I'll I'll preach again March 5th today's February 5th so I'll preach again March 5th and I'm just trying to well I'm trying to not drop dead on you guys on stage (laughs) like after having a stroke and uh in the meantime, haven't you guys enjoyed these preachers we brought in? I mean, great preachers. Next weekend, we got a gentleman by the name of Robert Madu out of Dallas, Texas, that will be with us. He's, he's, he's a great preacher. And, um, but I was thinking a lot about this sermon and how I wanted to end it because... I, feel, I just feel like, man, sometimes everybody gets so close to the presence of God. You get so close. You just didn't reach out. You just weren't deliberate. And so we purposely put one of the songs at the end today where we could have a deliberate moment where we could have a reaching out moment. And I don't know what that means for you, but we're gonna worship. I said, we're not here to be watched. We're here to worship. We're here to worship. Every one of these people, we're here to worship. But I just feel like if you reach out to Jesus, He's going to touch you. But be deliberate. You might want to make a place of of an altar. You might want to drop to your knees physically. You you, you drop to your knees in your heart. But we're going to worship. There's no hurry. Wait, what's the hurry? What's the hurry? What's the hurry? I better hurry up and get out of the presence of God. Parking's tight. Like, (laughs) pretty sure you'll be all right. 
<laughs> Traffic jam for Jesus, baby. That's just okay. <laughs> but before we do that, I'm going to pray for you. Would you bow your heads? If you're here today, if you're here today, and I know there's going to be quite a few of you, but if you're here today, you don't have a relationship with Jesus Christ yet. I just believe that's why you're here. I believe that it's God ordained, that it was a divine meeting that he set up for you to be here today. Hear this sermon, to hear these words, because he knew they would change your life. And the Bible says that God loves you so much that he gave his one and only son, Jesus, to die for you. Unconditionally died for you before he even knew anything, any sin you were going to ever commit. Like he, he's, he died for you. He loves you unconditionally. No strings attached. Listen, doesn't matter what you did. Didn't matter who you did it to. Didn't matter. Doesn't matter. He loves you. He loves you. Don't you ever forget that Jesus loves you. And if that's you today, you say, you know what? I'm not a Christian, but I want to become a Christian today. I want, to, I want to acknowledge Jesus as my Savior today. Would you just put your hand in the air? Put it up so I can see it. Put it up so I can see it. There's a lot of hands. Just, just keep them up for just a minute. It's, it's awesome. There's so many hands. I, I, just keep them up for just a minute. So many, so many, so many. You can put them down for you want to put them down. I want you to know, those of you that lift your hands, that I'm, I'm proud of you. Our church is proud of you. Our church family is proud of you. That's the best decision, the biggest decision you can ever make in your life because it's eternal. And if, if you prayed that prayer, in fact, let's all, just, let's all do this with them together, all of us. Let's pray this prayer out loud. Dear Jesus, today I give you my life. I acknowledge you as my Lord and my Savior. Thank you for dying for me. I want to live for you. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen.